Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Jackie Witt. I'm a professor here at the Army War College and the War Room podcast editor. I'm here today with Dr. Andrew Hill, who is our editor of The War Room, and Dr. Paul Kahn, who is also a professor. Thank you, Jackie, for having us here. Definitely. All right, so what we're going to try to do today is talk about a concept, and we're going to see sort of where it goes. We haven't pre-planned questions. We haven't pre-planned a script. (laughs) Um, But what I'd like to throw out is a term that actually originated with the Army War College uh, maybe a couple decades ago, and it's a term that I have some... You hate. Okay. <laughs> this is Andrew, by the way. All right. You, you hate it. I hate it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the term is this. It's VUCA. So that stands for, it's an acronym, because of course it's an acronym. It has to be. Um, I've heard we use those in the Department of Defense. <laughs> or an, an, it's an initialism, I should say, right? But it stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Yeah. And so the idea behind this acronym, and I think it came to be in the 1990s, was that somehow this this time in the 90s, right, the post-Cold War period and transformation and all sorts of whiz-bang stuff happening, was somehow different from everything that had come before. And it required, therefore, like new ways of thinking and new ways of being and new ways of doing things. Okay, so fast forward and we're still... We still use it. Right. Right. Um, But what does it mean? How does it happen? And what does it tell us about our own time and maybe egocentrism that we are convinced that we're living in the most VUCA time ever? (laughs) It's all VUCA'd up, as it were. I don't know if we can say that on a podcast. I guess we'll see. So, all right, so what what would it mean for something to be all vooked up or all vooked up, depending on how you want to say it? <laughs> yeah, I tried to start something called APOP, which is the acronym phase-out program, <laughs> but but nobody got the irony, and we just kind of dropped it. So, so, DOA. Yeah, it's DOA. <laughs> That's right. DOA by COB. Um, yeah, I don't know why we still have VUCA, for example. So, Well, you uh, know what's intensely ironic to mm-hmm. me about VUCA is that it gains currency. And I may be wrong on this, and I'm sure if I am, I'll get like 15 <laughs> commenters. Well, it's the one thing about the internet. Oh, yeah. The internet will tell me that I'm wrong. So, yeah. But I, I may Even be wrong, but I believe wrong, that this became you. really current at the War College. As you said, it's in that period between the collapse of the Soviet Union and 9-11, That's right. which if we're being objective about like American power and security, that seems like a pretty happy time, right? I mean, you know, we're, yeah. we're not dealing now with the constant threat of, you know, potentially a global thermonuclear war, war games right. reference. But um, we, we also aren't yet in that kind of unsatisfying, disturbing post 9-11 world. Also, there's no Snapchat, Facebook. The Internet hasn't really become a thing. Right. Young people mm-hmm. still make eye contact. I have this New Yorker cartoon on, on my door that, that says, when I make eye, t- eye contact for the first time, I want it to be with the right person. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't really, kids, on kids some level, I don't days. even get how they could have yeah. thought <laughs> that that world was especially exceptional. If, well, if and that I mean, it's exceptional in the sense, if you think about uncertainty, I think the, the budget uncertainty. War, there's budget uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. The Cold War, and it's sort of a perverse way to think about it, but political scientists like to talk all the time about how stable bipolar systems are, right? And that mm. the that unipolarity and multipolarity are actually far more unstable international systems. So I can see where all of these adjectives feel like they're happening in the 1990s right. in this period of sort of wandering or uncertainty. So and maybe it's only with hindsight that this yeah. sounds absurd, um, yeah, I guess also, I mean, if you think of the 1990s, bef- obviously before 9-11, for the U.S. military, there were all these, as you were saying, Andrew, unsatisfying interventions that were humanitarian interventions, right? So there was Somalia, there was the failed kind of intervention in Haiti initially, then there was a successful one, 
Then there was Rwanda, and that was really – we didn't intervene Not in that one. Then we had the Balkans and Kosovo. And so the military, um, they were wondering – with another acronym, right? Remember MUTWA? M-O-O-T-W, Military Operations Other, other than, than War. war. And so they're thinking, well, what is this military for if we can't use it? The Madeleine Albright quote. And then the whole question became about, well, so what is war? And they kind of made this meta argument, well, war is uh, military operations other than Mutwa. So it kind of folded in on itself until 9-11. And it seemed like, oh, wait, we got a purpose now and we're, we're going on the offense against terrorists. But then, of course, that brings up other questions mm. about the nature of war, about what war is how long wars should last. Right. Um, and if you remember during the 2000 presidential campaign, I think it was uh, Condoleezza Rice who said, look, the 82nd Airborne is not going to be escorting school children to school. It's uh, We are not armed social workers. So there became all of that entwined in this this kind of VUCA. Right? It's, it's, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's, it's ambiguous. Volatile, interestingly enough, didn't necessarily mean violent. It just meant all the other words, right? I mean, uncertain and ambiguous. Andrew, you and I were talking about that earlier. It's like, well, what's the difference between volatile, uncertain, uncertain and ambiguous? And it, yeah, yeah, it's like well, complex captures a different dynamic, but the other three. Hmm. Do they feel like synonyms? Yeah. They're, yeah. So I guess, I mean, I, I definitely take your point that if you're looking at the world from the perspective of the U.S. Army, things do appear to be a bit weirder in 1992 than they did say in 1988 not less scary but weirder right yeah so so you you don't have that pacing kind of power or scenario it's like Mm. we're not okay now it's not the full the gap and all that other other stuff it's 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 something else and we're looking for that for that something else right um but from the perspective of world history right Mm. If, if any of us are, are looking for a period that we would sort of opt out of, I don't think the 1990s would be high on our list. <laughs> right. The 90s, right? yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, like, yeah. I was like a kid. It was great. Yeah. Like, I, would, uh, I wouldn't choose the 1990s. I just... Yeah. All right. So this is a new way to frame the question, right? So if you could, if you could opt out, like just hands down, mm. that is absolutely not the time or the place I would want to live. If we agree that the 1990s are okay... Like scrunchies excluded. Yeah, and obviously there's a where here, right? So we're talking yeah. America in the 1990s, right? right? Because right, like, your point, Rwanda, Rwanda as a as a Tootsie uh, in the 1990s yeah. is not great. So. No, no, it, it it's reminds me of my old, one of my old professors from from the University of Denver who used to pick. He was a historian. He would pick battles who would want to be in because. Yeah, those are the ones that that particular side won. So, you know, Battle of Hastings, English side. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, this is this is, this will be a winner for me. I want to be there and say, awesome. I, I was at that one, and I won. <laughs> so, yeah, but well, which one do you not want to be on? Battle of Kenai uh, on the Roman side. <laughs> that's, that's like 70,000. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I, there are a lot of good candidates for opting out. Mm. Um but I, I, I think I would opt out of like Western Europe in the thir- in the fourteenth century. So in the thirteen hundreds, yeah, you know the the plague, uh, it takes anywhere from like a third to a half. I guess if yeah. you count all of the sort of iterations of of epidemics from like thirteen forty nine, yeah, it just keeps coming back. Yeah, through yeah. the end of the century, it's like half the population. And then on top of that, as uh, Jackie and I teach this great books course, we we read uh, Barbara Tuchman's book, A Distant Mirror, which is a really wonderful book to read, even if, you know, as a medieval historian, I'm sure they will quibble with some of her analysis and conclusions. But one thing that... I have to that, put that disclaimer in yeah. right now, that as a historian, we don't read that book for yeah. history reasons. It's beautifully written, though, <laughs> and, a, a and a great book. book. I highly recommend it. Um, and, and, and on the big facts, I think she's pretty accurate that it was an awful time. You yeah. know, just <laughs> an awful time. And there's war all the, all over the place. And yeah. at that time, the, the Catholic Church also goes through a terrible crisis, which really shakes, I think, people's confidence in sort of the one institution that was going to give them Binding, right. like a feeling of maybe safety despite all this yeah. horrible stuff that's going on. It's like, well, at least I've got God. Well, eh, now yeah. there's popes maybe and not. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. And at least it was a binding kind of political yeah. institution in a way as well. It's sort yeah. of... All right. So, okay. Hmm. So Europe in the 14th century, yeah. Western Europe, not a place we want to live. Not a great one. Um, Paul, what about you? Oh, well, uh, definitely in the late 1930s, uh, China. 
uh, when oh, you're invaded by the Japanese. That's a bad one. Um, yeah, around Manchuria and the puppet regime of Manchu Kuo. And I just, I, you know, on the Chinese side, you don't want to be around that because um, it's just as terrifying as anything that yeah. was occurring. Plus, that pretty much goes Europe up through, like, the Great Leap Forward. And, I mean, you have, like, yeah, several keeps, decades of bad. Yeah, that's a good if you're point. A Chinese bad peasant, stuff. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. Great Leap Forward is not... And it's not that much longer until the Cultural Revolution yeah. occurs in China. So you're going through that period, and then just as you're out of that, you begin the seedlings of Tiananmen Square. Uh, so yeah, there's that, that 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 sort of horrifying bookend of the Republic of China when the Republic right. of China is invaded to the People's Republic of China and the social experiments that go on there. Um, so yeah, I, I would want to opt out of that and actually my on my dad's side who's from hong kong they opted out in the 60s because they were they were concerned that during the proletariat revolution um and the cultural revolution that uh china was going to roll over the border into hong kong take it from the british anyway so they said see ya we're we're going to canada so um yeah they're they were actually canadians for for well they still are canadians um, all right jackie all right so i'm gonna go with North America in the sort of decades preceding the Columbian Exchange and to include sort of conquest by Western European explorers. Mm. Being a um, Native American. Being a Native American um, in, that, in that period. Just because I'm trying to imagine the terror of epidemic and disease mm-hmm. that has come earlier yeah and actually for most of them it precedes the arrival of right. actual europeans and right? and so the, you so you 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 have clearly something's happening right up to 90 percent of the population is gone Ugh. and you have no right you don't have a theory of germs mm-hmm. you don't have a theory of disease so i think we're back to your point about sort of plague you when it's unpredictable and it's taking right. literally just everyone and you have no explanation for what's happening and then of course once the europeans do arrive um things don't get any better uh, yeah uh, that would be an understatement yeah. you know yeah. and, yeah. and, and we, worse. right we see we see the we see, we see the consequences of it right here in right here in carlisle mm-hmm. um right there's constant reminders of mm-hmm. of what european colonization does to native populations mm-hmm. yeah. um and so, yeah, talk about volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous to to put yourself in the shoes of someone else, right? To have that sort of empathy for other people in other places, right. uh, whether it's uh, Rwandan in 1994 or uh, a Chinese person. Um, yeah, during the 30s. During and, the 30s. And then on through into the People's Republic of right. China, yeah. Um, so I think that, to me, that that's what... Maybe more than anything else, that's what VUCA m- misses, mm. is that any any of your own experiences, when you're trying to make sense of the wider world around you, are are, are going to probably feel volatile, uncertain, complex, and yeah, ambiguous. Yeah. And to, to treat our own time period as if it's somehow exceptional feels intellectually and sort of morally wrong yeah. to me. It's, it's weird. I, I often wonder whether we... Do we do we new do do we need a new lexicon, um, or do we already have the right words that we're just misapplying? Hmm. That we're sort of using them on the wrong problem. So VUCA being the example of well, this is well that in and of it, that that acronym is almost a word the way we kind of treat it around here. So it is kind of a lexicon in a way. Well, it becomes uh, shorthand, right? Just yeah, that's right. That it that it it's means intellectual all shorthand. sorts of all yeah. sorts of things, uh, brings up all sorts of connotations or whatever. But do we think it's useful? I don't think it's useful because mm. I don't think it creates any kind of like distinguishing framework where you would sort of say, "Hey, this this period demands these special tools." Like, find yeah. me a time yeah. in history when you know good judgment and like a sort of rigorous, open-minded approach to understanding your environment work. Right useful mm. or where a stewardship of resources wasn't right required yeah or, or wise or strategic right? yeah, or just wise in general or yeah, strategic yeah. vision and thinking wasn't yeah important. i i just and i i think to your point we do we are very as human beings we are very egocentric i mean mm. like we, each human being is sort of his or her own universe and and 
for that reason, I mean, and there's a lot of good in that. Like, I, and I, I think in Western civilization, we certainly celebrate the individual and the meaning of the individual. But one of the consequences is, I think, of that individualism is you tend to see the in period you inhabit as exceptional because you're in it. Like, you are the star right. of the show and you're in it. One of our colleagues, Buck Haberichter, has this hilarious sign in his office that says, uh, like, my, if my life is a movie, it has a great cast, but the plot is confusing, you know? <laughs> so, um, and, and yeah, sometimes the plot is confusing because it's, it's challenging. But I, I just, I, 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 I feel like we really ought to push back a little bit on this tendency because to your point about VUCA, yeah, it starts in the early 90s. But interestingly, it hasn't gone well, away. We still and use it. We still That's use right. it. And, yeah. and you're seeing different words. Paul, you talked about language and how we're using these terms. But you're seeing different words used to d- describe this. Like there was a recent, relatively recent piece by um, General John Allen, a retired Marine General right. John Allen, um, who obviously is very highly regarded, really, I'm sure, a bright guy. He wrote this piece um, with Amir Hussein on hyperwar. Yeah. Okay. And he talks about what, what hyperwar consists of. And, you know, it's, he, he talks about AI and automation and, and so on. Um, he says the major effect result of all these capabilities coming together will be an innovation warfare has never seen before. The minima- minimization of human decision making and the vast majority of processes traditionally required to wage war. So that, I think, is a, a me- meaningful change. But then, um, then it, it sort of talks about how that affects the speed right. with which war proceeds. And, and yes. you know, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. No, the, no that's fine. Because then, then again, we still get into the operational description of war, right? The speed, whether human beings will be in the loop. But what, what's the strategic, what could be a strategic cause or reason for war around AI? It might be something that becomes ideological about AI. It's like, well, why does this mm-hmm. country have this advantage which is ai and we don't and what does that mean for their national power so it, it it's actually a bigger question than just hey, right. the it speed can actually of break down lots of lots of questions about the composition of of power how do you mm. how do you constitute power how do you execute it what are the limits of right various forms of power and things like that um we keep we've we've talked about speed of change mm. A couple of times, right? And that, I think that's one of the things that actually maybe VUCA misses. Uh, maybe that's sort of encapsulated in volatile. Um, well, interestingly, it's not, right? So so here's the thing about mm. volatility. This is the dorky statistician coming out. So mm. volatility, you can have a highly volatile situation in which change isn't occurring right. at a high rate. D- volatility is just dispersion around the mean of change. Whereas like... If, if you have like Moore's law, Moore's law says, hey, uh, you know, the number of circuits on a on an integrated okay. circuit yeah. doubles every right. whatever, uh, yeah, 18 years. months or, yeah. you know, depending on the formulation. Well, if that's a reliable relationship, that's not volatile. But that, mm. that's really rapid change. Mm-hmm. And we have seen huge changes, obviously, right. in technology. But um, there's sort of some consistency in those changes. Yeah. It's yeah. like every time you go to the Apple store and buy a new iPhone, you might as well just have a garbage can at the end of the counter because the next one's rolling out. It's like, all right, let me just throw that one away and grab this. <laughs> By the you time know, you get to the Yeah, chair. oh, there's a new iOS, yeah. <laughs> so is there, but is there something about speed that we have to account for when we're, when we're thinking about change and warfare in particular um, or the information environment or whatever it is? Um, so are there things that are qualitatively different about the 21st century than say about the 13th century or the 19th century? Well, hmm. the short answer is, I mean, yes, things are really different. Um, as Homer Simpson once said, the internet is on the computer now. It's on the computer, right? <laughs> so, yeah, so things are different. But I mean, I, I don't know, like, I, I, I guess I, I would say that um, the speed thing could be really dangerous. I, I just, I'm reminded hmm. of my old friend Schlieffen, right? So like, you know, Sch- Schlieffen hit the Prussian, uh, you were help me out. with him? Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, I'm a little <laughs> older than I look, so. I, so <laughs> you look great. Yeah, I, I need to get on your <laughs> vitamin program. The Prussian war planner, right? So uh, author of the, Sch- of the Schlieffen plan. But like one of the problems with that was like all of the assumptions about speed, right? That drove sort of this 
need to then, you know, go to war quickly mm-hmm. in the event that you thought war might be emerging. Right, because you think you're not going to have time to respond because you think the the first blow is going to be yes the right. the only blow. I I'm I'm more meant in the in terms of the speed of maybe the dispersion or adoption of new technologies responses to it. Okay, so so I'm kind of getting there, okay. right? So so speed speed uh, technological speed is a is a factor of processing power and and communication primarily with like storage kind of playing an important role, but but less of a role all the time, interestingly, uh, and and so that that that's really what's behind this kind of acceleration broadly. But but in this argument about the speed of war itself, it's it's the same factors that are mm-hmm. uh, that are are they, they argue are driving this. And um, so yes, that that is different. But I think it's dangerous for us to accept that because of that, we must become much more quick right. sort of to respond as a as a nation to these sort of arising national security challenges. I, I think there's great virtue in coming up with ways to slow things down, develop right. resilience, right? Like, Or maybe the response to speed, to the increasing speed of something is actually to... Like you said, to slow it down, right? To create an obstacle, a right. speed a speed bump, rather than right to match right. the speed. Well, time can be asymmetric; can be an asymmetric advantage or disadvantage in in warfare. I mean, that's what mm-hmm. we've been seeing with our current wars, Afghanistan, and and we always and Iraq, assume that is... time is bad for us. Like mm. that, the more time passes, the worse it is for us. That's what we seem to assume, right? Well, I think that has mostly borne out in these wars that Paul was describing. Which makes sense, right? Because we're the away team. There's yeah, like huge it, asymmetry of interests right. there, and 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 of course, you know, Jackie Bean, his historian, can validate or invalidate this. Where the quote unquote American way of war was attritional warfare for the longest time was we're going to throw a lot of men and material at this problem and just grind it out. Well, this is, I mean, this is the this is true maybe in the in the American Civil War and World War Two, which right. are not in the Revolutionary War. No. The, no, that's not the no. no, but time. I'm talking about the time element. Yeah, but element. not yeah. attritional way. So, yes, you you've made you've sorry. Made, I was made think, two different. I was thinking about time. Two different anyway, points. Go ahead. That the historian mm. must validate. Um, <laughs> but World War Two and the American Civil War are not typical mm. of American, American experiences, wars. right? So mm. we think about what American militaries have been actually doing, and it's much more in line with. Nation building, armed social workers, mm, smaller wars, smaller wars. Yeah. Um, that's actually the American. I think there's a pretty compelling case we made. That that's actually the American way of war. Um, now we see constant pushback. We don't like it. Right. Um, we think that that maybe is not what it should be. Um, even right now, you can see in in like PME curricula, Coin is 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 moving out. Right. Um, and we're we're going to start talking about near peer competitors and, and, maneuvers, and major, yeah. major war again. Um, because I think this is, this is what the American standing army is. is well, and there's, for. there's, there's uh, no appetite in the U S military for accepting risk early in a conflict. I mean, it, 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 the interesting thing is that we tend to, it seems like historically we've done better as a nation in the conflicts that we, <laughs> we sort of started out not doing particularly well, yeah. So I mean, there's, a... you know, and, and so I guess what I wanted to ask you, Jackie, is, and I totally take your point about how you know the the time not being on our side has been borne out. But but if you consider, say, like a like a Russian adventure in the Baltics or a Chinese quote unquote adventure in Taiwan, hmm. if we had a way of protracting that, right, like making that less decisive for them, then time, I think, is on. The side of the, sure. the United States, it's right? Probably, yeah, I it would say it's rarely on the side of the more powerful actor because I think power often sort of degrades over time and will degrades. And I think, I mean, for democracies, I think it's even more complicated. Yeah. Actually, maybe it's, I think it's maybe just differently complicated mm. than it is for autocracies, which coming back to our point, which is everything's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> And there's there's not very you know easy answers on this stuff. No, not at all. 
Uh, and that's, again, that's why I'm sort of wondering whether or not we, do we have the right vocabulary or do we need an, right, so a what new would one? Be, what would be a more useful if VUCA is not useful, mm. if it's sort of egocentric and not descriptive and the categories aren't very helpful, what would be more useful ways of thinking about? Well, I guess the question is, are you trying to, are you trying to, describe describe your period in comparison to other periods or are you trying to just help people be better at understanding the period that they inhabit mm-hmm. whatever it is because if if that's if the second is what you're going for that you're just trying to equip people with better tools for an, analyzing their own time then whatever i mean these are all kind of interesting and useful ideas I just I, I kind of take issue with the implied like exceptionalism you know that we've used right. in which we've used VUCA. Here, yeah, here at the and, War and it's and it's VUCA is not even necessarily about time. It's because it's always implied or applied to the environment. It's a VUCA environment, the strategic mm-hmm. environment. Um, so, okay, that. that that has no time limit. It's not necessarily bounded by time. It's the right, and in operating fact, it's strategic evolving. Yes. Yeah. So, which I think is actually, that's a word yeah, that, evolving, that I would yeah. that I would advocate for, or adaptation, or something like that. Yeah, Evolution Turning or, or adaptation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the environment it, itself is VUCA, and that's where. But if I've all sort of environments taken, are VUCA, is that's right. Who cares? Why, why is it useful? That's my point. So, despite the age. Yeah. Despite what you know. So, so one. I think itself. one thing that that we really, I think one thing that in my experience here at the War College, I've noticed amongst many students is a tendency to, um, fail to acknowledge the degree to which whatever the thing is that we're trying to do militarily, it's probably just the start. Even in the most mm. successful scenario, it's just the start of some kind of multi-decade commitment that involves other elements of American power and unofficial kind of American power. Mm. And the, you know, end state is, is not a useful kind of construct. Like your work, Paul, on, on uh, narco trafficking and right. drug cartels and stuff like that. I, I often think of the drug wars as a great kind of microcosm, even though that's its own macro thing. Oh, but, right. oh, but, but sort sure. of, it's a, it's a microcosm of this problem like drug war, I think is a terrible metaphor. Oh, it is right because wars can be won. Yeah, and drugs can't fight back. Uh, well, there's a <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a great book by Fred E. Clay called "Every War Must, Must End, End." Right, which if you haven't read it, I I highly recommend mm. it. It's a short reading, you can read it in the afternoon. Um, but the the premise is in fact that that all wars come to an end. He's trying to interrogate how and and why. Right, and I think. In my mind, what we what we what we see and what we have seen historically, in some cases, but not wanted to admit, is that some wars may not end, or some wars, right, sort of plant. This is back to Liddell Hart, and they plant right. the seeds of the of the, the next one, um, and it's far less bounded by by time and definitive start and end points. Hmm. Um, one of my favorite things to do to ask students. Uh, when we're talking about a historical war, say let's say World War One, hmm. when did World War One start? Depends. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, be as and be as specific yeah. as you can. Yeah. Right? When does it start? Does it start with mobilization? Does it start with a declaration of war? Does it start with the first shots fired? Yeah. Um, does it start for different countries on different days? Um, and it's that question starts is, with the Franco-Prussian War. Yeah. Does it start? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah it, <laughs> centuries before. Yeah. And that question is just as complicated as when does World War One end, mm. right? Yeah. Like I think they just paid off the last sort of World War One reparations and war debts like two years ago. Well, and there is that whole long war, like Neil Ferguson yeah. and others, you know, describing the 20th century is just like one long war yeah. that starts in whatever 1914, we'll call it, and ends in 1991. Yeah, but that see that becomes kind of politically. Pr- problematic as well, well and i don't i mean you can't sort of that, if you're a politician you can, and it let's elevate that another maker. level now it yeah. becomes like all of human history right it's like well, yeah. one uh, long well war. you can't you know you can't you can't be a president and say into, like, hey let me start a war quotes, right about yeah. what is it the armistice or peace is only yeah, the treacherous armistice is peace. An endless war which yeah. is not actually right. thucydides but wonder woman said it was thucydides so oh really yeah must be true did wonder woman was quoting thucydides no wonder woman 
said she was, was misquoting Thucydides, but it was not. <laughs> Who is she actually quoting? You know, it's unclear. Uh, was it Sun Tzu? It, it, probably, Could be. probably. You don't know. It. We don't know. Um, so I think. So I think there's all of this suggests there are lots more complicated ways we need to be talking about war and strategy and the strategic environment and the strategic mm. problem. Um, in, in trying to come up with, again, that more useful language and that more useful vocabulary. Yeah, and that's, you know, we, we don't have time to offer our students a, yeah. a course on philosophy or, or uh, semiotics or... or Though I, I don't that, know, that's which sort would of be awesome. I, that's sort of how I teach the theory of war and strategy. I'm sure my students love it. Well, um, it's like, yeah. I tell them on the, on the first day, this is, yeah. this, is ba- this is a philosophy class. Yeah. That's what we're, that's what we're doing here. Mm. It's big um, thoughts, yeah. Yeah, so I and I also tell them they can't use a fuka. So they maybe they go together. I'm still ready to ban it. <laughs> ban it. <laughs> I just want you, you That know, sounds I, Orwellian. I shouldn't, I'm <laughs> not going to ban words from my classroom. Yeah. I know, you know my students over time they haven't really there'll be one or two students who'll use it. And then it sort of drops. Does it just feel buzzwordy? Like it feels yeah, like a thing that they're supposed to say? Or... Yeah, they do it. And then, of course, there's no real solution for it. It's like, okay, well, how do you make the environment less VUCA? How do you, or, or just pick one. How do you make it less uncertain or less complex? It's like, well, you know. And so, so they also get into the kind of very binary thinking of, well, it's either VUCA or it's not. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, no, no. There's they, a spectrum of VUCA? It's, well, it's, it's – even, even, if, even if you accept VUCA as – the whole, the whole ball of wax, the whole gamut. Uh, there are a lot of other things that are not necessarily unvukad, <laughs> you know, where where there's a, a kind of normal point. It's like, okay, here's normal and here's vuka. It's like, well, I, I don't know when that would ever have been. It's like, well, right. what was that period? Yeah, of time imagine that imagine a a hearing mm. where like some service chief sits down in front of the Senate Armed Services yeah. Committee and says, "Well, sirs uh, and madams." We're good. We, we like the, the way the world is right now. <laughs> we're good. Well, it's we're, almost we're pretty much. We, in fact, we have more. Yeah, we're gonna. We have more than we need. We're gonna, we're gonna we cancel. We're some gonna. Of our right. We're gonna hold here. You know, it's yeah. It's, yeah. So that's not. I mean, that's not good for a uh, right for the sort of self looking ice cream cone or whatever you want yeah. to call it that yeah. that you ha- that you have to convince someone else, your political masters, the the people mm. with the purse strings. Um, you've got to create need oh yeah there's right? an and there's a definite incentive to yeah. inflate need yeah. inflate risk I well, mean, and inflate threat yeah. right right yeah. yeah well if you go back again you brought up the example of quote-unquote the war on drugs or the drug war what and metrics so one of the the metrics you could use to say you're you're winning or you're losing the drug war would be number of interdictions interdictions of drug loads so we'll say it's interdiction oh. of <laughs> cocaine coming across the border hey this, this you know this year we have caught the biggest load of cocaine, biggest loads of cocaine ever. So we are clearly what winning or losing the war on drugs. Right. How much cocaine more, is coming in? It could be. Hey, is we're, more better we're, or yeah, because we're catching more, therefore we're winning. So give us more money and we'll end this. Or man, they are sending a whole lot more drugs yeah. that we're not catching, and they feel brazen enough to send this much. We need more money to tackle this we're not in bigger ways. Yeah, because we're they're yeah. clearly brazen. So. The argument can go either way, and it, it, it's that's right. sort of unmoored from evidence. Yeah, that's or, my favorite or, kind of argument. <laughs> you do well in Washington. I, I don't know about that. Um, well, there's that organization. I, I wish I could remember the name of it. I think they're in Sweden. Mm. Um, they track uh, international violent deaths year on year. They've uh-huh. got that. Cipri? I think it's yeah. Cipri. There, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different they do, databases. Yeah. They do, uh, yeah, and they um, have like one of the best databases database. on violent deaths mm. in, in in conflict, both right. civil wars and interstate wars and other mm-hmm. types. And you know what's telling when you look at that is is, and these are deaths like as a sort of proportion of the population. Right. So it'd be like your actuarial risk of dying in a violent mm. conflict that they've declined pretty much That's consistently right. oh, and dramatically. since right. the end yeah. of the Second World War. I think 2014 was notable because it was like the first year-on-year increase in yeah. a long time. Mm-hmm. Syria, and, Syria was a big, and some other things that. were, were yeah. causing that. So, you know, broadly speaking, and this is as a guy who works at the Army War College, so I'm like, I don't want to talk down the portfolio, but mm-hmm. I mean, the world is broadly speaking a relatively safe place, you know. And right. so that's not to say and that for Americans, it's a particularly right safe place, mm-hmm. right? And and so. 
I believe absolutely in preparing ourselves for a world in which right. other bad things might happen and so on and so forth. But I, I kind of think we we don't help ourselves when when we're not describing the world as it is. Yeah, or, or threat inflation, mm-hmm. which we've right. heard. That's a term, you know, a term of art, threat yeah. inflation. Um, All right, so final verdict, VUCA. Thumbs VUCA. up, thumbs down. Um, you know, funny, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily for banning it. I, I, would, I would keep it just as an intellectual foil. To actually, if we're gonna if we're gonna to have, have it to start this kind of to start this conversation, conversation. and I don't know to, to just kind of tear it down because always like a, a a good opportunity to poke holes in something. Sure. So this seems to be a a good one for now. And yeah, I, I think we need to we need some clarity about why we're using the term. Like, what are we trying to accomplish? Um, I, I think it's totally bogus mm. as a sort of comparative tool. I mean, it's mm. it, it. Oh, that's a good point. You would be yeah. mm-hmm. hard pressed to demonstrate, okay, that the, our period is more vuka'd up, to use Paul's term, <laughs> than than other periods, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's demonstrably like the 1930s. You mentioned the 1930s yeah. in your in uh, char- sorry China, but like the you 1930s know, what, what about Europe. like yeah, the 1930s, yeah. 1930s in, in South America? Yeah, these or, are all, <laughs> or being an Iraqi from 1980. Right. Through to today, or yeah. From I mean, my God, nineteen nineteen. Oh, yeah, through yeah. Today. I mean, yeah. yeah these yeah. are so. So as a comparative tool, it's, it's. I just I think it's indefensible. As an analytical tool, I don't think we teach it that way. Like I don't think we don't use it as a tool for actually hmm. analyzing the environment. Right. It just, I think it's just shorthand. It's just a shorthand for saying, "Oh, the world is." complicated is, or complex. Woo, like yeah. there's a lot going on out there <laughs> that's busy like, oh boy. like if we did a heat map of like yeah. headaches or something you know potential right. national security headaches somehow the yeah. implication is that like it's the world is just super hot right yeah. well i kind of think the world's always that way um i would rather have a conversation you know where we talked about things in a way that really facilitated like analysis yeah. where you could maybe help people understand hey where are things going and what are our reasonable expectations about about that, like that might help us in Afghanistan, yeah. right. for example. Yeah. Like, yeah. what what is the kind of war termination condition for the United and States? And what are the a, possible in futures we can we right. can imagine? Yeah. What are the war termination? Yeah. This is sort of where I am. I find it. I, so I'm I'm probably closer to banning it than than <laughs> either of you, um, because I find it both comparatively. Have you not listened to your and, says Evuka? <laughs> <laughs> and have that re- removed? And analytically, not terribly yeah. useful um so i think it's i think it's good to to sort of break down and poke holes in things um but i'd i'd, I'd rather sort of build something up and constitute something oh yeah that's a fair uh, point more yeah. useful um so anyway gentlemen thanks for joining me today here on a better piece the war room podcast thanks for having us thanks for having us jackie and that concludes our program thank you for listening the views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.